everyone. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Lily Mera. I'm an engineering manager at OneSignal in San Mateo, California. I've been using Rust professionally on sort of side of desk projects since about 2017. And in 2019, I started at OneSignal where it's used as a primary language. I spoke at RustConf 2021 about the importance of not over-optimizing our Rust programs. I've spoken at many Rust meetup groups, and I'm the author of the book, Refactoring to Rust. If you've heard of Rust before, you have probably heard one thing over and over and over again. You've probably heard that it's pretty fast. It generally performs on par with something like C or, or C++. It's way faster than some dynamic languages that we're maybe using, like Python or Ruby. And if you have an older monolithic application written in one of these languages, maybe with something like Django or Rails, then it might be tempting if you're performance constrained to say, well, let's throw this whole thing out and let's, uh, let's start over with Rust. You know, Rust is fast. We want to go fast. Let's rewrite it in Rust. This is a very tempting idea, but the realities often, as they do, encroach on our perfect vision. Full rewrite projects can often be quite problematic for a number of reasons, um, some of which they can often take a lot longer than we expect. We think something's going to take a month, it ends up taking three years. We think something is going to be really, really easy. We realize that the problem was so much more complicated than we realized. We can introduce new bugs because different programming languages have different paradigms. And when you're trying to adapt old code into a new system, you can uh, misunderstand the way the old thing worked. Full rewrites often also do not fix underlying architectural problems. So this might be things like, you know, using the wrong database technology. It might also be things in the code we think a piece of code looks ugly because we don't understand everything that's going on and we try and rewrite it in a simpler way. We realize that, oh, there actually was a reason we did all those things in a very strange way in the original code. So full rewrite projects are often problematic. So what, what else is available to us? There's also microservices, of course. We can break out our monolith into multiple services. We can, we can, uh, put the performance where it needs to be put and leave the monolithic stuff in the monolith. But if you're working at a place that doesn't really have a robust infrastructure for managing a bunch of microservices, maybe you're working at a place where there really is just one monolith rolled out on a couple of boxes and you're really not ready for the architectural shift of going to a bunch of microservices. What do you do in this case? We're going to discuss the feasibility aspect in a little bit more detail later, but the gist of it is that microservices are always the best option for everybody in every circumstance, of course. So I would like today to propose an alternative that, uh, that we can use. And for the purposes of having a term for it, I'm going to refer to it as FFI refactoring. FFI refactoring is where we take a little piece of the code we rewrite it in a faster language, in this case, Rust, and we connect it to the original code base using CFFI. This is something that's going to be a little bit abstracted for us, and it's going to be made a lot easier by some of the binding libraries that we're going to be using. But the underlying technology is CFFI, so we're going to refer to it as FFI refactoring. We're also going to be using the terms host language to refer to the original programming language and guest language to refer to the new programming language. So when is this an acceptable strategy for us to use? As I said before, if you're working in a place that has a really robust infrastructure for working with lots of microservices, then maybe consider using a microservice. Like <laughs> if there's an existing pattern sitting there ready for you to use, maybe just use that existing pattern. It's generally much easier to follow what's already sitting there than to try and blaze a new trail. But if you're in a place where there isn't a robust infrastructure for microservices, if architecturally shifting to microservices would be really difficult for you, or maybe you're running code on an end user device and you don't necessarily want to have a bunch of binaries talking to each other over networking, local loopback networking, in order to uh, run your program, 
then maybe FFI refactoring is a better option for you. There are some unfortunate realities that we're going to need to discuss when we're going to FFI refactoring because we're going to move to multiple languages for our program, we are probably going to be complicating our deployments a bit, right? Because we're going to have to ship not just a bunch of Python and Ruby files to the servers. We're going to have to compile Rust beforehand. We're going to have to ship Rust uh, dynamic library files to our servers. We're going to have to make sure OS versions and compiler versions match up. This will get slightly more complicated. It's possible that we can add bugs. Just like with a full rewrite project, all we're doing now is a rewrite on a smaller scale. So because we're re-implementing code, we can of course create bugs. But because it's on a smaller scale, the, the chance for that is maybe a little bit less. We will definitely have to watch out for translation bugs because we're moving between multiple programming languages. We don't have to just worry about the quirks of Python. We also have to worry about the quirks of Python and Rust and the quirks of translating Python data structures to Rust data structures. So what makes a good project for an FFI refactor? As I've kept hammering home, it's, it's very similar to the discussion that we've been having for several years now of microservices versus monoliths. Do we want to make our big deploy even bigger, or do we want to split it out into a bunch of stuff? Microservices can be great. You can scale independently. You can upgrade independently. You can deploy independently. One thing going down doesn't necessarily take everything else down. There's lots of reasons to use microservices. But there's also reasons to consider doing an FFI refactor. As I've said, if you, ha if you have uh, if you have a monolith and it would be difficult for you to go to a microservices based approach, maybe do FFI refactoring. Or it may also be the case that you need to do a very slight performance bump. And that could be maybe dwarfed by networking overhead. And if you use an FFI refactor, you can keep everything within memory within a single process and you can get some serious performance benefits by doing that. You should also consider what language you're using as your host language. So if we take a look at this little compass here, we can see there are some languages that are going to be uh, slower than Rust, where re doing an FFI refactor to Rust will probably improve performance. And C and C++ generally are like on par with Rust as far as performance goes maybe slightly faster. So re doing an FFI refactor to Rust might actually decrease performance a little bit. You should also consider how the tooling is for your language. So some languages, Ruby, Python, Node.js, have really, really good tooling for integrating with Rust. Um, Lua also has quite good tooling for integrating with Rust. So languages in this upper right quadrant right here are going to be really good choices for us to use for an FFI refactor. If you're dealing with something that has poor tooling or something that's really not going to get much of a performance benefit from refactoring to Rust, then you should maybe consider other options. Go is a pretty interesting choice because Go is at a similar performance level to Rust. Rust is generally faster because it doesn't have a garbage collector. It doesn't have quite as heavy of a runtime. However, the tooling is not great because if we wanted to integrate Go with Rust, we have to rely on the CFFI. And Go developers can tell you that once you have to invoke the CFFI in Go, it slows down a lot. So there hasn't been a whole lot of development work on building out great Go bindings that I'm aware of at least, because people are aware that there's this huge performance penalty that will have to be paid if you want to do uh, an FFI linking between Go and Rust. So generally speaking, a language like Ruby, Python, Node, Lua is going to be a really good choice and others not so good. So for the purposes of having a concrete example to talk through in the rest of this talk, we're going to imagine that you're a developer, you're working on a Flask HTTP server application that's written in Python. We're just going to take a look at this one handler just so that we have something really small and concise that we can deal with. 
This handler, if we can uh, see, it uh, takes in a list of numbers in a JSON request post body, and it computes several statistical properties about those numbers. It computes the range, which is the, the difference between the maximum and the minimum values. It computes the quartiles, which are the 25th, 50th, and 75th percentiles. It computes the mean, the average of all the numbers, and it computes the standard deviation, which is something that I don't exactly know the definition of. But statist statisticians tell me it's important. So let's see how we can do an FFI refactor. Let's see how we can redo this in Rust. Let's go. Um, in this section, as I'm talking through Rust code, I have been advised by the conference organizers that it is better to talk at a more advanced level and assume that people will do some research outside. So there is a free resource at doc.rustlang.org slash book. This is, the, this is the book, The Rust Programming Language, written by Steve Klabnik and Carol Nichols Goulding. It's available for free online. And there's a few places where I'm going to be calling out uh, which chapter in the Rust programming language you should read through if you would like to get some more information on one of these subjects. But if you are interested in Rust more generally, I would highly recommend reading through the book because it's a pretty good book. Alrighty, so we're going to get started by creating a new Rust project by running cargo new dash dash lib rstats. This is going to create a couple new files for us. The first one is cargo.toml which is sort of like the, the package manager's uh, registry file, sort of like package JSON in a node project. And it's going to create a lib.rs file. This is the, the entry point for our, our crate. So let's open up that cargo.toml file, and we're going to add a couple of dependencies. The first one is we're going to add a statistics crate, version 0 0.15 of a crate called statrs. If you noticed in the Python code, we were actually using the statistics module from Python's standard library. Rust has a much, much smaller standard library than Python's. It basically only includes uh, OS primitives, things like files, threads, um, basic timer functionality, and uh, some networking code, as well as some generic data structures. Uh, Python has a very, very large standard library by comparison. So we're bringing in this statistics crate so that we have access to some statistical functions. We're also going to be bringing in version 0 0.16 of the PyO3 crate. PyO3 is going to be used to generate the bindings that talk between Rust and Python. We're also going to need to enable the extension module feature. This is required for making an extension module, making something that compiles Rust code into something that Python knows how to deal with. There are other features available for doing different things. You can, for example, write Rust code that runs Python code. Lots of different options available to us. We're also going to add a little bit of metadata further up in the cargo.toml. We're going to set the crate type to be a cdilib. So normally when we compile Rust, we're actually compiling code that is only useful to the same version of the Rust compiler on the same hardware architecture. So setting the crate type to cdilib will actually uh, cause us to use C calling conventions, and this is necessary so that the Python interpreter knows how to call our functions. Now the, uh, the general architecture of, of what we're going to do here, we have our Python code, we have our Rust code. Uh, the Flask library is going to call into our Python HTTP handler, which is going to deserialize the JSON response, the JSON request body. It's going to send that over across the FFI boundary into Rust, which is going to compute the statistics. Then we're going to send that back across the FFI boundary to Python, and that is going to be serialized back into JSON, which is then going to go back out to the HTTP client. We could pretty easily, perhaps more easily even, have the JSON deserialize and serialize steps happen inside of Rust. But I didn't want to do that because it kind of goes against the spirit of this talk. Like the, the idea is that we can take one piece of functionality and we can rewrite that one piece of functionality in Rust. And in my mind, the, uh, the JSON serialize deserializing is 
some extra piece of work that you know needs to say in Python for for some reason. So we're going to keep that in Python. It's also going to give us the opportunity to see how we can pass structured data back and forth between these two languages. Because if we were doing the JSON parsing and uh, serializing in Rust, then we would actually be just be passing strings back and forth. And that's a little bit less interesting. So now let's go ahead and jump into the code. We're going to open up the lib.rs file in the source directory. And there's going to be a bunch of starter code in there. And we're just going to go ahead and delete all that. And we're going to create a new function called compute stats. It's going to take in a vec of X F64s. That is a growable array of floating point 64 bit floating point numbers that lives on the heap. And we're going to call that numbers. But what is our, what is our return type going to be on this function? So let's, let's look back to the Python code really briefly. The Python code returns a JSON object that has these four properties. It has a range, quartiles, means, and std dev, standard deviation. In Rust, we generally don't pass around like anonymous dictionaries that have uh, complex types for the values. Generally speaking, we use structs that have well-typed fields. So we're going to create a new struct in our Rust code. We're going to call it statistics response. And it's going to have those expected four fields in it. It's going to have three F64 values for the range, the mean, and the standard deviation. And it's also going to have a quartiles field that has an array of three F64 values. So this is going to match the structure of, of our Python code. And then we'll set the return type of our compute stats function to be that statistics response type. We're now going to need to bring in a couple of types from the uh, StatRS library. These are, these are all necessary, and I know there's a lot of them. But uh, we're going to bring in data, distribution, max, min, and order statistics. Um, some of these are types. Some of these are traits. But we need to bring all of them in so that we can compute the statistics that we need to. All righty, jumping down back into our compute stats function. We're going to take that uh, vector of numbers and we're going to put it into a data, which is a type that we just pulled out of the stat RS crate. This is necessary because a lot of the traits that we just pulled in, they can only be called on a data instance and not on a vector directly. You can also see that we marked our uh, data as being mutable. That is because in order to compute some of these statistics, stat RS is actually going to shuffle some of the elements in our uh, in our data structure around. And if you're used to coming from uh, a language like Python or Ruby or Java, then this might seem a little bit strange to you because normally I think in those languages, if items need to be shuffled around, it's pretty common for the library to actually make a defensive copy of whatever your, your input buffer is so that as a user of that library, you're not going to have your data changed around. But Generally speaking, Rust takes the exact opposite approach, where if things need to be mutated under the hood, that will be exposed to the users. So that uh, if the original order of your data buffer was not strictly required, you don't have to do any defensive copies at all. And your code can be just a teensy bit little faster. So if you have a really, really big set of numbers that you're computing statistics on, you don't need to copy those at all. You know, you could have a multi gigabyte vector of, of numbers to compute statistics on, and they'll just be shuffled around in memory as required instead of needing to be copied just to preserve ordering that we don't necessarily care about. Alrighty, now we can get to filling in our statistics response. So we'll, we'll put an instance of statistics response at the end of our function, and we'll start filling in the fields. Computing the range is relatively straightforward, very similar to what we did in Python. We'll subtract the max from the min. Computing the quartiles is also pretty straightforward. We can use the lower quartile, median, and upper quartile functions on our uh, data instance. Computing the mean is very straightforward, but it does have one little extra trick on it. Notice that the call here is data.mean.unwrap. .dot .dot 
So what is this unwrap telling us? Well, for that, we're going to need to jump to the definition of the distribution trait. And we can see that, uh, that the mean function does not actually return a value directly. It returns an option value. Um, this is something that's unique to Rust and some other ML type languages. And if you're used to coming from a different language, you're probably used to dealing with null values. Null values are a special kind of value that can generally be assigned to variables of any type. And if you, if you want to write code that correctly handles null values, you basically need to pepper checks all over your code. You need to repeat those checks because any string instance or array instance or hash map instance might actually secretly be holding a none value. Um, Rust does not have the concepts of Rust does not have the concept of null. It doesn't have a, a secret variable that can be assigned to uh, variables of any type. So instead, Rust has a special type called option, and instead of being a special value that can be assigned to variables of any type, um, an option is a wrapper that goes around that goes around a variable. And if you have a uh, if you have an F64, for example, if you have that 64-bit flo floating point number, that is always guaranteed to be initialized to something. If you have a VEC, that is always guaranteed to be initialized to something. But if you have an option VEC or an option F64, then you have to write the code that deals with the possibility that that thing is not initialized. And that code looks something like this. So we can use a match statement. Um, and we, we need to deal with the case that there's nothing there if we want to deal with the thing that is inside of the option. So comparing the two, option versus null. Option is strongly typed. You can't get away with forgetting to check something. You can also centralize your checks, which is really, really nice and really, really powerful. Because like I said, when you're dealing with null values, you don't necessarily know that the input, the input value to a function or the return value from a function isn't null because according to the type system, it's theoretically possible for any function in say Java or Ruby or Python to return null. So you, we end up repeating null checks all over the place. But with option, because it's strongly typed, you can convert an option vec into a vec. And then as long as you write the rest of your code to deal with a vec, you know that it's initialized and you never have to do that check again. It's very, uh, very convenient and it leads to great peace of mind knowing that things are initialized. So let's, let's jump back to our code and, and see what that one, that one line that we made all that fuss was about. Uh, on this line, we have data.mean, which remember returns an option F64, and then we call unwrap on it. Unwrap is a function for dealing with options it will look at the thing, it will look at the option, and if there's a value present, it returns the value. And if there's no value present, it will actually panic the whole thread and uh, make the thread abort. Well, make the thread unwind up to a point where there's a panic handler. Generally speaking, in production code, you don't want to be using unwrap. You want to be using proper, proper handling of our options with a match statement like we had previously. But this is this is quick and dirty, so we're gonna we're gonna use an, an unwrap. If you'd like some more information on using options, I believe you can read chapter six of the Rust programming language. Similarly, when we calculate the standard deviation, this function also returns an option, so we're also gonna need to use unwrap on it. Now, we have our statistics response, it's got all the fields in it. But it's actually not very useful to us yet because it's a Rust function that returns a Rust data type. And we need a Python function. We need something that we can run from Python and call from our Flask HTTP handler. We don't have it yet. So let's do that. We're going to need to import some more types from this time PyO3. PyO3, remember, is the, the, uh, the Rust crate that allows us to write bindings between Python and Rust. We're going to bring in PyO3 prelude star. Uh, a prelude is a convention, but not necessarily a requirement for Rust crates. If there's a lot of types and traits and macros and things, 
that need to be brought in in order for your crate to be really useful. It can be common for crate authors to include a module called Prelude that includes all the most commonly needed things. So you can use a, a glob import like this as we're doing here. Now, uh, before we can make a uh, Python function, we actually need to make a module first, a Python module. So a thing that can be imported in Python. And in order to do that, we need to write a function that has the same name as our crate, which recall is rstats. So we'll write a function called rstats and we're gonna add this little annotation above it, uh, pi module. This is coming from the prelude of PyO3, and it is going to automatically expand at compile time into a bunch of uh, C stuff that the Python interpreter knows how to read and knows how to turn into a module. This uh, is gonna require us to add a couple of parameters to this function. They're not both gonna be used, but they're both required based on the definition of the pi module macro. The first one is just called Python. <laughs> this is a type that comes from PyO3 and it represents taking the GIL, the global interpreter lock of the Python interpreter. So a lot of times if you're constructing a Python type, you need access to the Python type. <laughs> um, and this is, this is to prove to PyO3 that you are holding onto the GIL because it's uh, it's kind of easy to misuse the GIL when you're writing uh, Python C code. Since we're not actually using it in, in this function, we're going to prefix it with an underscore so that the Rust compiler doesn't complain and say, hey, you have an unused parameter on this function. Alrighty. Next up, we are going to add a, uh, a parameter called M, and this is going to be a reference to a Py module type. As implied, this is a reference to an empty Python module, and inside the body of this function, we are going to add our new uh, compute stats function to the Python module. We also need to set a return type for our pi module function, for our R stats function, and that return type is going to be pi result, open parenthesis, close parenthesis. Now, there's a couple interesting things going on in here. So we're going to take just a sec and uh, jump through them real quick. The result type is the way that we handle errors in Rust. So Rust does not have an exception system that bubbles values up and lets you catch exceptions with, with handlers. Instead, much like with options, we have a result type that has two branches. It has an OK branch, which also contains a success value inside of it. And there's an error branch that also contains an error value inside of it. These are strongly typed. So if you want to assume that your function returned a successful result and get the successful result out, you have to deal with the possibility that your function returned an error. And that code generally looks like this. Just like with option, we would use a match statement and we'd say, if it's okay, then pull the value out and do something with it. If there was an error, pull the error out and do something with it. Uh, so that is result. If you'd like more information on using the result type for error handling, I believe you can read chapter nine of the Rust programming language. But we also had something inside of the result type. We had that open parenthesis, close parenthesis. And this is something called the unit type, which is uh, an empty tuple. It's an interesting thing that's somewhat unique to Rust. This is somewhat similar, but not exactly similar to a null value. So a null value, remember we said, can generally be assigned to values of any type. Uh, but the unit type is actually a type in and of itself. And so you cannot actually assign, assign the unit value to anything other than a variable of the unit type. It represents nothing. So if we, if we jump back to our function, it has a pi result return type, which is actually just a, uh, it's actually just a, a wrapper type, uh, an alias type that comes from the pi03 crate. And it has its, its error side always set to being a pi03 Python error. Um, and you just have to fill in the success side. And so we have our success side set to the unit type because 
remember that a, a result is going to communicate either a success or an error. And we really only have side effects in this function. We have the side effect of defining a function in here, putting a function onto our module. There's not like a value that we can return. We're not like fetching something from a database that might fail. So there's not a great sentinel value that we could return. So we're going to use the unit type instead. So the body of this function, we're just going to put that, uh, that OK, that success case with the unit value inside of it. And this isn't going to define our compute stats function in a way that Python knows how to deal with, but it is going to define a Python module called our stats. So let's try and use it real quick. So we'll jump back over to the Python code. We will add import our stats to the top and we'll try to run our Python code and we're going to get a giant error because there's no module name. There's no module named our stats that Python knows how to import. If you, if you nested your RStats folder directly under the folder where the Python code is, this is actually going to work, but it's not actually going to be importing the module that we care about. It's actually, it's just going to be importing the directory in, in a way that Python can, can default to sometimes. The Python module system is a little confusing. Anyways, we want to write something that is actually going to be importing our Rust code, not just a directory. So still on the CLI, uh, we're going to install a developer tool that's created by the PyO3 team called Maturin. We're going to jump into our uh, RStats folder, the, the folder with our Rust code, and we're going to run Maturin develop. This is going to compile our Rust code and generate some Python bindings for it. Now, if we run flask run, it's going to start up successfully. There's not going to be an error because that uh, Python module is going to be present. It is going to know how to import our stats. Alrighty, so let's jump back over to our Rust code and see what we can do. Let's bring in our compute stats function. On top of the compute stats function, we're going to add this pi function annotation. And that is going to add some extra code at compile time. Once again, that is going to transform the input types and the output types into something that Python knows how to deal with. So if we actually try to compile this Rust code right now, it's actually going to give us a huge compiler error. Um, and it's going to say it doesn't actually know how to turn a statistics response into something that Python knows how to deal with. So we got to fix that. We can do that by adding some more of these little decorators onto our Rust code. We're going to add the pi class attribute macro on top of our statistics response struct. And we're going to add the pio3 get uh, attribute macro on top of all of the fields of our statistics response. This is necessary so that we can access all of these individual fields. Otherwise, they would just sort of be hidden from the Python side. Next, we're going to jump down into our module definition function. And we are going to put in this somewhat complicated line of code. It's, I know it's a lot to look at, but it is well documented and all the steps are, are necessary. Um, we're going to call the add function function on our module, and we're going to pass that the results of the wrap pi function macro on our compute stats function, and that also needs access to the module. And then these question marks that are here at the end are, uh, are air handling. So those are actually going to be doing an early return if, uh, if those expressions fail, if they evaluate to error responses. So we're almost there. We're so close. We have re-implemented the functionality. We have generated the Python bindings. We have exposed those bindings to Python, and we have generated a Python class that we can use in order to get access to our fields. Let's, uh, let's recompile our Rust code. So we'll, we'll run cargo build from the command line. And we don't need to run mature and develop again because of the sim links that were created. We can just recompile normally. And this is going to regenerate everything that's required. Now we can, uh, we can do the Python, the Python refactoring. Over in the Python code, we can change up our handler a little bit. 
um, we can call our stats dot compute stats. That's the function that we exposed that we wrote and we exposed, um, and we'll pass it our numbers, just the normal numbers that that come straight out of the requests uh, JSON body, and then we are going to pass all of the fields from our response from the statistics response into Flask's JSONify function. Um, we actually do have to walk all of the fields here individually, unfortunately. PyO3 does not automatically generate JSON deserializable Py classes. We could do it with a little bit of extra work, but um, we're not going to do that in this talk. So we're just going to walk walk all of the fields manually. And uh, yeah, we can now boot up our Flask uh, application and we can try running it. We can try running our HTTP handler. So let's use curl. We'll hit that stats endpoint. And we do get some numbers back. Awesome. It's it's all working. Everything's flowing great. Let's also, uh, just for fun, let's compare the results from our Python handler, the original Python handler that was 100% Python, as well as our refactored handler. And oh dear, there are actually some differences in here. These, are, these values are, are not the same. The quartiles fields are different between Python and Rust. And in my research, I learned that there are some differences in statistical libraries and how they compute uh, quartiles of, of large data series. So uh, what do we do? Well, I'm not an engineer anymore, but let me think back on my time as a staff engineer and uh, give you a great answer to that question. It depends. That's right. You actually have to use your brain. You have to think about the needs of your system and you have to figure out exactly what you need to do. There's a number of strategies that we can take to fix this problem, depending on our needs. What can we do? There's two broad things we can do. We can maintain the existing behavior exactly, or we can figure out if there's a way we can deal with it. Maybe this, this change is acceptable for your system for some reason. I don't know why it might be, but maybe it is. Maybe you can update your clients so that they can deal with this change, but maybe it is possible for you to deal with it. But if you want to maintain behavior, you need your code to return exactly the same stuff. What can we do? There's a couple strategies we can explore. We could try using a different library. Maybe there's something other than StatRS that has the same return values for uh, quartiles as the Python code. What if that's not an option? Maybe we could re-implement Python statistics library in Rust. Maybe it's not quite as fast as, as StatRS, but even just rewriting the exact same code can often be much faster because Python is going to have a lot more copying, a lot more GC overhead than something like Rust will. There's another option too. Because we're taking an incremental approach here, we could actually leave the quartile calculation within Python completely. We don't need to do everything in Rust. It's just something that we can do. Um, yes. So based on what your needs are, based on your specific situation, you need to explore one of these options. I left this error in here on purpose so that we could discuss this. Um, it's very important. Yeah. Alrighty, now that we have our functionality written, let's talk about how we could test it. I know everybody loves writing tests. Everybody loves having super long test suites, but tests are super important, especially when we're going between multiple languages. So we're gonna, re we're gonna write some, uh, some unit tests in our Rust code so that we can do uh, automatic validation. We're gonna create a new module at the bottom of our Rust code called tests. The name of the module isn't strictly important, it's just convention. We're going to add an attribute macro on top of the module. Uh, this is going to do conditional compilation for us, so the test code is not going to be included in any production build. It's only going to be compiled when we write test code. We are going to import the compute stats function from the root of the crate into our test module. And we're going to write a new function called test nine numbers. 
adding the test attribute macro on top of our function is going to give us the ability to have our function picked up by Rust's automated test harness, and it will run the function and uh, give us an alert if the function panics, which is, is going to happen if, if any of our assertions fail. Let's pop in some known, st some known numbers. Let's uh, calculate the statistics for that set of known numbers. And we're going to add in some assertions. And these are easy to calculate because it's only nine numbers. We can run our tests by using cargo test. And this is going to tell us that we had, this is going to compile our code for us. And it's going to tell us that we had one test function and it ran successfully. Now, one unit test is obviously not enough to, to deal with a whole big refactor like this. Like I said, we're going between multiple languages and we really need to be careful with our testing. So you should be leveraging existing tests. You should be leveraging the tests that already exist in Python and you should be uh, updating those so that they're capable of testing not just the Python code, but the Rust code as well. Because compute stats is just a normal Python function, you can call it from either place. You can rely on dependency injection as well, so that you can test uh, you can test more code paths with both the Python code and the Rust code. And something else you can do is actually do randomized testing between the old code and the new code. So generate a random input, feed it into the old code, see what it gets you back, and then feed it into the new code and compare those two results. They should match up. Let's also talk about performance. We did this whole thing with the goal of making our code faster. Did we do it? <laughs> Let's see. We can use Python's time it module to uh, do some micro benchmarking. So for the purposes of this micro benchmark, stats pi is a function that has the original code of our Python HTTP handler in it. We're going to feed in those nine numbers, and uh, we're going to run this 10,000 times. We're going to do a very similar thing with our Rust code. We're going to take those nine numbers, and we are going to compute those stats 10,000 times. And let's see what we got. What happened? We can see that the Rust code uh, ran about 100 times faster than the Python code, a little more than 10 times, 100 times faster, actually. And this seems really promising. This is very cool. So remember that this is a benchmark that's running through Python. So we're, we're not just getting uh, the faster code because it's all in Rust, but uh, w w there is a certain amount of overhead that comes from it being in Python, too. So this is, you know, somewhat fair. <laughs> but there's a little bit of uh, there's a little bit of trickery going on in here because remember we ran the test 10,000 times and this is actually the total time. Once we add in the average time, it starts to get a little bit less impressive, right? Because you divide those numbers by 10,000 and you realize, oh, well the the python code was pretty pretty quick on its own already. Um Yes, this is not an extremely slow problem. I was feeling a little bit uncreative when I came up with this problem, but uh, if you started with something that was taking, you know, 500 milliseconds a second, five seconds in Python code, you know, you might expect to see significantly more impressive results from, from refactoring to Rust. So we did make the thing 100 times faster. That did actually happen. However, it was already operating at a, a relatively quick speed in the Python to begin with. We also have to consider macro benchmarking. It's really tempting to just want to do a micro benchmark, like <laughs> just put the teeniest bit of code on the bench and, and test that. Like that's going to give you the best results or the, the, the best looking results at least. But if we do a macro benchmark that compares the HTTP performance of the old code and the new code, we can see that it's it's like about a 15% performance difference between Python and Rust. And that's because a lot of the time that is spent in our HTTP endpoint is going into the Flask library itself and its HTTP handling and the JSON serializing, deserializing. So 
Once again, we should be picking something that is pretty CPU bound where we're spending a lot of our time in one place and we should be pulling that into Rust. Micro benchmarks and macro benchmarks are both super important. They're both, they both have their uses, but uh, it, is important, it is important to do macro benchmarks and to make sure you know how your system is actually performing under load. Alrighty, so we've gone through quite a bit in, in kind of a short period of time today. Uh, we looked at FFI refactoring and what it is. We looked at how to think about the feasibility of an FFI refactoring project. We learned how we can use the PIO3 library to do an FFI refactoring project. We learned a little bit about how we can test systems using Rust's uh, testing framework. And we looked at how we could do some benchmarking strategies for an FFI refactoring project. Alrighty. I had so much fun putting this talk together and uh, speaking with everybody today. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you enjoyed this talk, I really hope that you'll check out my book, Refactoring to Rust. It's available at manning.com. And I do have some discount codes as well as a few copies of my book that I'm going to be raffling off for free on the uh, Slack channel after this talk. I hope you'll come and check those out. Mm -hmm.